So, a uh, uh, warm hello from us as well. It's great to see a full house because we thought the weather is so fantastic today that nobody's turning up. But Siri and Katarina, I think you made my day. <laughs> um, the whole talk will be in English. It's not going to be translated, just that you know. Um, I hope that's fine for you. Um, and I would like to start the discussion, which will last about an hour, um, with asking you to... Has it ever been uh, a disadvantage for you two to write as a female writer and to work as a female artist? So has the gender been a topic in how you have been Who's going to go first? <laughs> you, you do. Ah, well, you know, these are, are sensitive uh, subjects, obviously. Um, and I think that... Uh, As a 60-year-old woman now, I have a hindsight on my own writing life. And um, it seems rather clear to me that as an older woman, it's much easier for people, both men and women, to wrap their minds around um, an artist who is also an intellectual. When I was younger, it was much harder. Uh, why? Why do you think that has changed? Uh, I think that there, <clears throat> there remains a profound cultural bias about young, uh, to be honest, fertile w women. And that the idea of the body is still so deeply associated with women, and the intellect remains associated with masculinity. And these stubborn binaries between culture and nature, mind and body, persist. I think they're often unconscious, but um, when a woman gets older, uh, I don't know, maybe we start to look more like men or something. <laughs> it's, it's easier to, to deal with doesn't really seem to be the case in your case. But. Well, therefore I'm here. <laughs> so, Katharina, do you share this experience that it's getting easier once you get older? I mean, apart from the fact you're not old, but... Uh, yeah, well, um, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess that's something I can absolutely share in terms of what I see happening in the art world. A lot of uh, women that have made... Um, top appearances, as we like to call it, maybe sometimes. They are older women, like Louise Bourgeois, for example, or Agnes Martin. Or, But on the other hand, I want to say that um, there's, there are so many layers to this all. And I was, it took me a little while to understand that when I was um, studying and being more part of the art world, I was surprised how many expectations and how different the expectations were and how precise they were that were being brought towards you. So this idea of that it's like free and all in the flow <laughs> and we go naked and cry out what we think, it wasn't at all like this. <laughs> it was more uh, actually the contrary. And um, I'm sure that my gay friends would share that, but I think in many, many ways a lot of my, of my male um, artist friends would say that too, but it's not being discussed. It's very conservative. It's a very conservative um, area in, in a way. And um, I was very decided at the early, maybe some pearls of wisdom from my early years, but um, I, uh, I was um, studying with different teachers and some of them were um, performance artists, mm -hmm. others were painters. And I was uh, slowly finding out what I wanted to do. I made films, I performed, I painted. I um, glued sand on uh, like uh, chairs and stuff, you know. <laughs> and after a little while, it uh, dawned upon me that color is really my, my one and all love, my big love, my emotion. That's where I live like a fish in the water somehow. And then I kind of started all over again. But when I was um, drifting towards performance art and still painting, the, these people would say, don't paint. It's a male-dominated area. You're not going to get anywhere. And when I painted, they would say, you can't paint because you're a woman. Go, go better to the women's arts department. And Where I was are the kind of... women's arts department? Well, that was performance art and video art, you know, so... So, so that was an interesting situation. And, of course, I, I didn't get it 
you know. But how, how did you react to that? I mean, to this kind of stupid perception at the time? Because obviously it's different once you have the experience, you get mm. older, you know the, how the system functions and how you mm. function in the system. Mm. So as a younger artist, I mean, that must have been quite shocking, but obviously it didn't shock you so much. No, I was probably gifted with an enormous amount of naivete, I guess. I somehow made it through, I have no idea how. But I was also seeing that others were struggling too, so that helped. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because that was what would be uh, the question to what you both said, that it's more difficult once you're younger. What did you do then when you were confronted with a system that didn't really want you at the time? Well, you know, I, I, I don't think actually in my literary career, I've never really felt unwanted. I, and, and it's important to specify that. I mean, I was published, you know, from the beginning. I've always had publishers. You know, I've been lucky in that way. I mean, I can think of gifted writers, both men and women, who have not had uh, the same luck in a way. So I, I, that's important to specify. But um, I think that what fascinates me, first of all, probably all artists need to have what Katarina is talking about, which is Catherine the Great, by the way, that's what I've been going around thinking. Yeah, time you know, travel. <laughs> I'm going to be doing an event with Catherine the Great. It's um, a pretty great name to have. Yeah, I know, but I was, I tell you something. Talking it's about, not her real um, name, though. Camouflage. I wanted another name. That was the first thing I wanted. I wanted another name. Yeah. So, anyway, Maybe we could perseverance. Talk about it <laughs> perseverance is clearly important for all artists. And I'm giving a little talk in Munich about Louise Bourgeois. And uh, in that talk, I mention having read a psychoanalyst who wrote an essay about what he calls adaptive grandiosity. And adaptive grandiosity, grandiosity in psychoanalysis is usually regarded as a bad thing. You know, we, can, we all know the stories about all the Napoleons in the hospital. That's a form of grandiosity. Uh, when I was working as a writing teacher in a psychiatric hospital, there were two messiahs there at the same time. <laughs> This can be dangerous. But adaptive grandiosity, is I, he argues, and I agree with him, it's something that artists need. So someone like Emily Dickinson working alone who wrote and sent her poems to the great literary man of the era, Higginson, and he wrote back, it wasn't that he didn't admire them, but he was condescending, and he told her she needed to, you know, clean up her rhythms, and this wasn't, you know, she wasn't ready to publish. This is the greatest genius, I think, greatest literary genius that America has ever produced. Um, and she didn't pay any attention to him. That's adaptive grandiosity. She understood her own internal <laughs> genius. And I think that all artists, and maybe particularly women artists, have to uh, uh, compensate for the world in some way by a form of adaptive grandiosity, which is not about talent. It's about the fact that for reasons unknown, you think that what your inner life, that your inner life is somehow important to other people. But, <laughs> <laughs> which is a little bit crazy, but it's, um, it's necessary. But how important is it like for you as a writer, for you as an, an artist to actually come out with this inner strength? I mean, obviously, you can feel it inside, but there's another point of being in the public, showing your work to the public. Um, is that also something where routine and experience helped you to be stronger to do that? Routine and, and experience. experience, yeah. Uh, experience, for sure. But on the other hand, um, that kind of um, maybe adaptive grandiosity that I've learned now, or that kind of blindness, which is an interesting, um, pro can be a very productive 
um, competence actually makes it uh, possible for you to do it. So that you kind of block out or filter out all these things that could come towards you at a certain po moment. And the moment that you're required to do certain things, that you're expected to do certain, th uh, certain things, that's when you fall out of that ability to fil put the filter on. And I think that there is another thing that comes into mind, and I think that's really great what you were saying, and brilliant also in the interview how you put it. This um, ability as a woman, I think, and um, I've been talking with a friend of mine yesterday about it, Annika Reich, who is also sitting here, we are working together in text work, that um, there is a certain advantage maybe even in being at the first years in a shadow world, we could yeah. call it, or uh, in the moment of being maybe not so actually in uh, having to perform, yeah, or having to make it so fast, because you can get to know the second space, because the main um, agreed space that we all know, that is kind of agreed upon by a certain ruling uh, class or caste, that we all know. We grow up with it, we know it inside out, but we know it from a different perspective. We know it from a perspective that men don't know it so often from. And minorities know this from that perspective as well. And therefore, and I think it's not by chance that um, really great artists in the 20th century, for example, were gay men. Yeah, because they had the chance of knowing two spaces or knowing a gap, which you only experience once you're actually um, pushed into it. And it took me a little while that I was living in that gap too because of my um, different uh, ways of not being acknowledged, of not being in different, uh, of being actually in different um, reins of expectation. And I thought I was actually like a genius, but the society didn't think I was. <laughs> and so, so, and I that know. kind of helped me to uh, like have, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a cool trick actually, no. yeah. try. No, I, th I think it's true. And also working, you know, the drama of making whether it's visual art or, or writing a novel, in my case, if you're thinking about what the outside is going to think, you're completely screwed. So, you know, it, you have to be buried inside this strange world of mostly unconscious and some highly conscious production uh, to do the work. And then when it's done, you can start worrying about, you know, whether people are going to think this is madness or, or, or what, y you know. Um, but I, no, I agree with you. You're, you're buried inside some place that doesn't have anything to do with the external realities. Yeah, but we are still confronted with the situation, and you, you've mentioned that in, in several of your essays and interviews, that um, although we live in the year of 2015, female artists are still underrepresented in the big institutions, and we discussed yes. that before. Yes. So um, obviously the question that is, is arising is, is it a question of quality, or is it still a question of male decisions that have a different view on female art, that it's still the case that you are underrepresented. Uh, yeah, that's true. I think um, in all society, um, uh, the um, opinion making and decision making plateaus are being ruled by uh, white men. And that's the same in the art world, that's everywhere the same. And, um, uh, whether we like it or not, that's how it is. And it has to change. I think it absolutely has to change. We have to work for this on all possible levels. Um, we have to be uh, super um, alert and present. But why do they look different on female work compared to male work? Well, fuck knows. I mean, it's because um, <laughs> like um, men are supposed to be, because if men are the ruling people, yeah. then yeah. the ruling person has to be a man, or the ruling work has to be made by a man. That's yeah, how it but is. But I, I think, too, you know, there's this um, wonderful German 19th century biophysicist, Hermann von Helmholtz, who wrote a great book on optics. And he had an idea that has come roaring back now in neuroscience, but it was, and I wish I could remember the German, but it's unconscious perceptual inference. So his theory was that the way we perceive the world is through um, former patterns, through our expectations, and 
so we're filling in the blanks, essentially, all the time. We're, the brain is looking for patterns. And if you think about this carefully, then you begin to understand why expectation becomes part of the viewing experience. Uh, this is borne out now over and over again. So that if you expect greatness, and greatness has been generally associated with men, that will become part of your experience. I love, you know, just simple stories about a museum has a Rembrandt. People are walking by in, you know, sort of sacred obeisance to the Rembrandt. And then one day, day they realize it's not Rembrandt. <laughs> it's the same painting. It goes straight to the basement. Uh, I think we have to be alert to these ideas of greatness, ideas of um, uh, expectation that are deeply involved in every human being's perceptual experience, and unless we become conscious of them, it will go on the way it is. But even if we uh, are confronted with those patterns and we are have say have the ability to actually perceive that we are in those patterns ourselves, do you see a chance to actually change the patterns? Because obviously, you know, it's a long tradition. There's a long history to patterns, and it goes back to how we grew up in our families who are based on patterns before that family. Um, so where would be the chance to actually either destroy them or use them differently or question them more? Well, I think there are a number of strategies. I've been involved with the um, Brooklyn Museum, and there's now a feminist wing of the Brooklyn Museum, most famously uh, a house for Judy Chicago's dinner party. And, um, and what Elizabeth Sackler, who's head of the feminist wing, talks about is alternative models, that there are ways to... Uh, not do it in the same old way, to organize uh, different kinds of exhibitions, to bring in people uh, from the neighborhood, say, around the Brooklyn Museum. There are ways, there are, it doesn't have to be, you know, the Jeff Koons model. $54.8 million for balloon dog orange. This is not, this does not have to be our fantasy, right? You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Well, I mean, it was <laughs> expensive to make, <laughs> so. It's very expensive to make, still. How do you, how difficult do you find it to Yeah, I mean, this question you asked this. earlier, is it routine and experience that makes it easier for you to be with the public? And what we are saying right now is actually totally against routine and experience, because that would be something to um, think of, that we are actually much more adaptable to changes that are brought to us with all that's happening in our world, since we are one big mesh and not just singular items that make like 45 million orange right. balloon dogs. So, I mean, that <laughs> right. is an interest yeah. on another level. We are so yeah. intertwined and inter uh, so, like, um, uh, interconnected yeah. and interrelated that we have to uh, understand that we actually need to do away with all sorts of habitual thinking and acting. And Not only with... Um, I mean, I like yeah. this idea of the uh, feminist wing. Actually, I don't like the idea of the feminist wing at all anymore. It was a, a good crutch. It was a good tool. It was a prop. It helped us like this show as well. Brings it all up and shows us actually there are these people making that work. And it has changed a lot in the last 20, 30 years. It's amazing what kind of work has been made by young people, women, you know, men and alike, and the amount of women that do on a high profile have a career that is, um, has also influenced the um, contemporary art production to such an extent. We'll think back of video body-oriented works, now we have Matthew Barney, who is yeah. like the one who, star who's kind of yes, sucked and up who all was, the... Who has, that's true, but, and who has deeply influenced, of yeah, course, much by so. the earlier yeah. work, and very most of that so. work was by women. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, what I'm absolutely. saying. So there is yeah. this uh, enormous influence, but I think 
it would be great to have it more, of course, on the same level, to have it all in one, to rewrite the history. That would be an active, a very big activity. Yeah? So uh, to get away from all these expectations we have towards one another, to have really the wish and the, uh, the longing to be on the same level with the other being if it's um, a man or a woman or a kid or a white or a black or whatever, because we also tend then to look down on other people because of certain uh, differences in class or upbringing and so on. So, I mean, that would be super. No? What would be the strategy for that? Maybe a total different education, I think, would be really good. Um, just one little thought. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting because when we were preparing this exhibition, um, we were asking ourselves, is it actually a good idea to have an exhibition with all female artists? Isn't this a very conservative access to representing art? And wouldn't it be much better to just have good artists, female or male, no, no difference? But then on the other hand, and we have a, I think we had a bad example in Berlin, um, was it two years ago, uh, about painting, you know, the big exhibition uh, which was fueled uh, all the museums in Berlin. And it was the same binarity. You had like the men in one big museum, the major museum, and you had all the females in another museum, which was not so important as the other museum. So obviously we have to also, from a curatorial point of view, we have to ask ourselves which could be the ways to represent female art in a, in a way that it becomes normal or like, you know, accessible to everyone. But then we decided yeah. to do this show also because uh, Thomas Olbricht's collection is one of the very few who has a very high percentage of female yeah. artists. And also because we had a very strong in, uh, interest in having certain topics to discuss here. So this is what I would like to know from you now. Do you think that nowadays we should kind of get away from the idea of this is female, so we show female artists, and this is male, or, you know, this is basically not of a discussion. Do you think it would be helpful not to have this idea of showing well, just we can, females? Well, we can, we can stop talking about women artists the moment people don't use that word to describe what you do. Huh? Nobody talks about man artists. You know, the white man artist, Sigma Polke. Who says that? I'm continually referred to as a woman artist, a woman novelist, you know. Uh, and actually, in, on, I, on Wikipedia, there was a big list of American novelists, and someone took out all the women and put them under women. <laughs> American novelists, you know? So we had our little separate ghetto. And, um, and there was, I, I know that a young woman, a young woman novelist became very upset about this and she wrote an article in the, in the New York Times and after that she was threatened. I mean, she got death threats and um, and still, uh, this goes on, you know, that people have been hunting her, so to speak, online and, and made her life a misery. And I think this should demonstrate how something so seemingly innocuous that this woman complains about someone removing all the women from, <laughs> you know, literature and putting them in a little side spot that this should produce intense rage. Huh? So it's good to think about that. You know, misogyny is not a universal, but it's out there. And misandry, the uh, opposite, hardly exists in the vocabulary of, of most cultures that I know of. I mean, it could be interesting also to start like a certain technique. Maybe we can all together design some little catalog on that, but um, to uh, stop attributing uh, femininity to f women and masculinity I to men. Totally I mean, that is agree. such a, um, that kind of makes the contour of the individual so um, like um, one dimensional. Yeah. And that could be a good start. I mean, uh, we all have masculine and feminine yeah. attributes, right? We all come out of a father and a mother. 
And I think that, you know, I've often thought of, what if Proust had been a woman? How would that work have been received? You know, or I've often thought about Henry James as a very feminine writer. Um, and there are women writers who are m far more masculine than Henry James. Yeah, but even if we would try that out, say if we go by the uh, conservative binary, male, aggressive, female, sensitive, and so on, if you think this through, and I don't know whether you made this experience yourself, if you say would behave or act like a female macho, as in strong, decisive, focused, I mean, we all know what the reactions are, you know. I mean, it's just not accepted, you know. It's uh, the criticism women get when they are too aggressive, when they use kind of male-related attitudes, we have a problem. Often you have a problem, although, you know, I do, I do a lot of work now in science, so unlike today, I'm often giving lectures for an audience that's 80% male. And, uh, Which do you like better? No, I, it's, it, just, it, it, there is some differences. And one of the differences is, of course, in science and philosophy, the idea is that people ask very tough questions and you have to answer back in a tough way. It's like, you know, the competition. So if you can't, you can't wimp out of this. You have to, and I, my technique now is that I count. Thank you so much for your question, but I disagree. One, two, it's so effective. <laughs> and, and, and I think, and people actually in those worlds, there's a lot of respect for that. You know, if you're smart, you're smart. If you know, you know. And um, so, but, but I think that you're absolutely right, of course, that aggression, when it's interpreted as aggression, People get very frightened. It's intimidating, you know? And I think it goes back to the fact that we all had mothers. And we were all helpless, dependent children. And a big, terrifying female figure returns not just men, but sometimes women, too, to that state of helplessness. Is that something that you can share? Yeah, I, I thought it was an interesting... Yeah, of course, I mean, all these ways that the Mother Mary cult and the relation... I mean, religion surely plays a very big part in that. But And also it is something that is being used as a, a narration to, of course, control the system as we've described it. But as we are now wanting to talk about ways how to get out of it and... Um, or how to maybe um, incorporate change. I think what is so interesting when you talk to your friends, and I have really wonderful male friends, amazingly, uh, you know, uh, intelligent, cultured, uh, studied, educated, etc., and really great, I wouldn't miss them. And then you talk about this issue that you have with society. It takes them a little while to understand that it really is something you have, and they can't follow it. That is so interesting. They don't, and they don't mean badly, or they don't um, don't want to see, or they're not ignorant. They do see that we are exploiting Africa or things like that, but they don't see <laughs> that yeah. um, half of the population is female and has constantly been deprived of their basic rights. Yeah. We do not, on the paper, we have the same rights, but we don't have it in our everyday life. Right. And that is something. If you say it very calmly, like I say it now, yeah. so experienced yeah. and calm and yeah. um, and then they go like nah that has changed that's not an issue anymore mm. and after a little while when you tell them what happens to you they start to think hmm, maybe that is the case but it is uh, there is a natural reflex when you ask them for example can you tell me oh we're looking for a a, a new person in our um, university in art uh, history, would you know maybe a woman because we don't have anybody in the theoretical department that is female <laughs> mm, can't think of anyone. And then you say a name, and then they say, ah, I think she's overestimated. 
you know, right away. It's a reflex. It's not even that it really is them thinking about it. And I think that's an interesting issue. It's like yeah. me not liking, I mean, um, mashed potatoes. It's a little bit yeah. like this issue, and I think this can be dissolved, but it takes a lot of um, um, discussing it, and I think we are, I mean, we, I mean women, are too lazy and not speaking up because it's not cool. Yeah. And I, I think that has to change. Mm -hmm. No, no, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, you see, there's, an, there's, there's a kind of embarrassment factor. You know, I mean, I'm just, I'm just out there now. You know, I think it's the most important thing is to talk about this. Mm. So I'm now, I have a, uh, an appointment as a lecturer in psychiatry at the medical school in New York, Weill Medical School. And every month there's a lecture. They're mostly men, they're mostly older than I am, if you can believe it. And uh, there are a few women. And there are these people come and give papers every month about different issues in psychiatric history. And I'm there for my first meeting. I'm newly appointed. And everyone's sitting around a table. And I watch as a woman tries to make her point. She's interrupted again and again and again by these men who just start talking. They just talk over her words. Of course, finally, she talks, but now she's pissed. I mean, now she's yeah. angry because she's been suppressed 40 times before she gets to say her piece. And I'm leaving with a friend of mine, a, a man, a psychiatrist whom I adore, uh, and we're very good friends. And he looked at me and, she sa and he said, boy, you know, she was really mean. <laughs> and I said, George, She'd been trying to talk for a half an hour, and she couldn't get in. Of course she was feeling a little mean by then. But it is true that the, that the most important thing is absolutely to keep your cool. And then you start to understand that calmness, uh, I have found this having disputes sometimes with men on issues about this, that they end up becoming like hysterical women. <laughs> because that's about power. Mm -hmm. huh? So that if you maintain your position, you just insist, then the tables get turned. And that's a very interesting thing to experience because we're so used to associating nagging mm, with women. Uh, uh, associating hysteria and crying with women. And of course, those are the positions of powerlessness. But if we turn it the other way around, I mean, when we discuss it as, a, as an open discussion between men and women, how difficult might it be for men to actually destroy their patterns? Because obviously a vulnerable man, a weak man, <coughs> Um, it's not accepted by the society either. Don't be too sensitive, you know. Um, this is something that's, that's not part of, of what we want to see in men either. So what I, what I want to gain to is, you know, how can we actually <laughs> get something from the other and then in the end maybe, that could be maybe a solution, I don't know, uh, some kind of coalition almost. Is that completely unrealistic? Um, when you talk to your friends, I mean, mm. you, you said they're very, you know, you bring them to understand what your patterns are or what you see what the patterns are. Do you see their patterns too? Yeah, I think we are also causing one another's patterns, I guess. Mm. Uh, and with the same unconsciousness that is so hard to um, deal with. And it would be really great. I mean, I wonder sometimes, I'm thinking, couldn't it be like stopping smoking? I mean, couldn't we all like <laughs> make this one kind of, um, I mean, you stop smoking once you don't smoke. It's actually quite convincing, isn't it? Okay. it there's no big drama or magic or Houdini about it. No. You just don't smoke. And um, I mean, wouldn't be life so much more like as we haven't ever seen it, that we are... I mean, couldn't be sex much more interesting, erotic play, 
um, maybe um, business making, doing things. Couldn't that be much more fun if we didn't always have to guard our, um, like, how do you say, you yeah. know, I mean, <coughs> that would be like the carrot. I mean, couldn't that be yeah. a great carrot that we are kind of trying to, I mean, no. I wonder, couldn't we create certain things that make it really, really, absolutely um, like a dream? No, I listen, I agree. I think, you know, feminism is about human freedom. Huh? Mm. I mean, if you think about play as a, a good model, women have been afforded a much greater deal of sartorial freedom, you know, mm. than men, for example. Uh, I mean, the so since the 18th century, the sober suit has been the male attire. I would think that it would be, of course, not all men, but most, many men, that, that it would be fun to extend sartorial play to the other sex. Um, that even in my book, I have a man whom I love who's kind of a sexist guy, but he says it's harder for men to fail. And when I wrote that line, I meant it deeply from Bruno's heart. And it's because the culture has built up such a standard of success for men. You know, he's trying to write this poem that he can't write because he feels the burden of all of Western history coming down on his head and he wants to write the greatest American poem ever written and he can't do it. Um, and I think, you know, that that's, of course, what happens when you put yourself into the perspective of the other. Also writing as men in other novels, I felt the heavy burden of classical seduction strategies. So writing as a man, I realized the burden of having to make the first move. I mean, this is in traditional things. You know, that the woman waits and the man... Picks up. Yeah. And that's not so good. And that must be hard and, and create a lot of anxiety. Isn't it much more interesting if those roles are really completely freed up? But if we think that through, have you ever experienced you both being supported by men in your work? Colleagues, I mean. You know. In my oh, work? Yeah, yeah, all yeah. the time. Mm, sure. But we're talking far bigger issues here. Somehow, no. I mean, in a sense, I mean, I, I find it an interesting question. Why doesn't, why is it so difficult to change apart from that change is difficult and that not everybody believes in change and change is also upsetting and is kind of putting that idea forward that we might change all the time and we try to not change yeah. <laughs> all, all these things. But is it also maybe an agreement, maybe in society, that we um, allow for these extravaganzas? Let's say we change our like in rock uh, music um, figures have done it. Let's say Keith Richard and his girlfriend, they exchanged their clothes and he all of a sudden saw, hey, I look quite um, good. good in those. <laughs> yeah? These yeah. sexy um, half see-through um, uh, silk sh um, blouses and scarves. There was all um, her stuff and he was so slim and slender he could wear it. Or when you think of... Um, uh, Jimi Hendrix, these kimonos things yeah. he was wearing. And yeah. then he took it all off at some point and took the rings off because he didn't want to be seen as the guy like... But, I mean, all these guys did it. And we, society granted them to do it. Even you're, you're even supposed to wear this. And that's a singularity, right? It's just yes. one... It's a small group of people who may do it. And maybe that's what society wants, that we want only these amazing idols to wear it and therefore they kind of do this whole transformation process for us which is then there are some people that kind of transcend this kind of idea of the um, uh, normal guy or girl or whatever and maybe that's um, an agreement that is an interesting thing to look at but I think yeah. a very important yeah. point is what, what you said is this um, idea of success that is um, dominating society in on all levels, not just the arts. I mean, yeah. and art nowadays is, is basically um, qualified by the price rather than the content more, more and more. Yes. Um, is there a possibility to kind of get to a point where something that is always con related to women that doubt, for example, 
could be quite an interesting energy to change things. Um, that insecurity could be something that might make us think more about where we are, who we are, where we want to go to. Yeah. So in some ways, yeah. reinterpret the yeah, attributes. So, so, you know, we all internalize the world, right? And the only way to break out of those internalizations is to try to think and feel our way towards something else, which is what you were saying. My youngest sister is an architect, and she has a firm with her husband, and they interview lots of architects for jobs because, you know, the office swells and shrinks according to the economy. And she said that it is amazing. They get women in with the incredible resumes. You know, they've worked everywhere, and then they always ask them, so what, what do you want for a salary? And the women ask for way too low. And there are novice men who have no experience and crappy resumes who ask for top dollar. And my brother-in-law, so here's a man, uh, was so incensed by this extraordinary resume of this woman who asked for this pittance that he said, do you really think that's what you're worth? And I think she hemmed and hawed. They ended up hiring her and paying her more than she asked for. But, you know, these are internalizations of, you know, worthlessness despite the truth. That's tough. And, of course, this has been happening in, uh, with, of course, racial questions. Now, I love, here's another study. I have many. But... You know, there's the old thing, you know, women can't do math, right? So there are these studies that, they, they, that are about, essentially it's a form of intimidation that changes the results. So if you give a math test to male and female students and before the test you say, um, actually women usually don't do as well as men on this test. The women's scores go down. If you say, this is actually a gender neutral test, the scores are completely even. This again should tell us something about how important it is. Uh, what is it called? It's called, it start, they started doing it with black people uh, in the United States. But I mean the situation of your sister and her husband, um Obviously, that, that could be something to actually destroy the patterns that we're in. Yeah. But um, to make this a kind of yeah. <laughs> work like, for the whole society, that may you be really something else. You really think that's else. what you're worth? Yeah. yeah. But um, is that, is that yeah, something... always ask for top dollar. <laughs> 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 no, but I'm thinking that this is a fascinating question. Mm. What you also asked earlier on, um, sometimes you might feel weak and sensitive and then you think, oh, am I maybe like a little nothing? Or, and I think that is a big misunderstanding, probably also rooted in our understanding of religion and, and the value system that's coming from there. And I think it is, I would really, maybe there could be a therapy for all of us that is encouraging us to be hybrid, more hybrid, to yes. accept that we can actually be this day like this and the next day like this. And so is our neighbor today really great and boisterous and tomorrow maybe didn't go so well or something and also I think that might crack open new possibilities that we are not even thinking of that we might, might not even know the feelings about yeah. that could be so interesting I mean I think we're pretty in, in many ways the dichotomy or the dialectic um, um, traditions make us sort the world out in certain um, patterns and I wonder whether the hybrid or and I think therefore women are pre Destined, do you say that word in English? Mm -hmm. Something like predestined. Predestined, yeah. predestined thank you. That um, to actually be really, 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 really important in, in lots of ways. And maybe not women, women, but uh, womanly people. Yeah. That yeah. we uh, know about these, um, uh, the, 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 the gap, the, that very secret space that has the hybrid um, um, uh, experience about things that can see both or more than just one issue of equality. I think that's a very, like an eye opening. Maybe we need eye drops or something. Couldn't we find yeah. eye drops in your wunderkammer somewhere and like a little. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'm guessing. <laughs> sure. 
But in my book, I call it hermaphroditic polyphony. That's, That's cool. a difficult word. So do we have eye drops that come from? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the hermaphrodite is both, right? And polyphony is many voices. Uh, many voices. So you're not stuck in this singular perspective, not just stuck where you are. The idea of the hybrid is, is a good one. And, and I think, you know, we're all create. you know those days when, picking up what Kat Katerina said, when you feel you're talking to a very quiet, withheld person, and suddenly you feel like a gigantic, loud, you know, monster. And then there are times when you're confronted with some very aggressive, very loud person, you begin to feel like the shrinking violet. And it's a relational drama that gets played out. And I think that in the culture, it's often that women will find themselves more often in the shrinking violet position because of the way the culture is organized, you know, because of these expectations. Yeah, but because this is what, what my experience often is with uh, female artists that uh, what you were mentioning about, for example, simple fact of money, you know, I mean, right. what are you worth from, right. a, from an economical point of view? Also, on the other, from a, from a more emotional point of view, um, when you feel doubtful, it's not a problem. It could be a strength because it makes you more sensitive, probably, towards different ways of acting as an artist. Um, when you confronted with female friends, female artist friends, is that something that you have experienced, that the doubt and the kind of weakness that might result of that can turn into something else, some other energy that can be put forward? Whether I have experienced uh, it with other people, with female friends, friends, female... Um, hmm. Or within yourself as well. Yeah, I know doubt, and uh, doubt in a sense that um, makes you wonder whether it's all crap what you're doing, or that kind of... of yeah. yeah, but um, that's more like a... You shrug it off, no? Yeah, it's part no. of the process, yeah, I it's think. Part of yeah. No, but I yeah. think that I, um, it's interesting to, un to not underestimate the moments where you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, th that's an interesting... Uh, is an interesting area where your work comes about, where you're not, um, in my case, I'm, I'm doing, I mean, I'm making things in a sense like uh, with my hands, and if I don't do that, I think maybe I'm not who I am. And I think that's an interesting question that comes along with this um, swaying back and forth of being top of hierarchy or low, that you're maybe losing your identity. And what do you think, how would you handle that? Is that maybe something that we are ne have to develop a culture of, like, um, I mean, I thought I was so jealous yesterday when I heard you say that you could talk in all these voices and you could experience actually. Yeah. I mean, that you had the, the persona at hand to be in that world of that persona. I thought, wow. You know, yeah, but that so, is. I mean, novels know. in that way probably. I mean, novels, you have all these voices. And in this particular novel, I'm writing the first person. And so losing the self into these others is part of the process. And could that yeah. be maybe also done apart from yoga classes, uh, <laughs> as a, um, like uh, like we have traffic rules? Well, you know, I mean that could be maybe. But you know there are ways to think about this as an ordinary human reality, which is the reality of the imagination, right? The imagination is uh, what every human being has, both in memory and in projecting into the future. Memory. And imagination, I think, are essentially the same faculty. Those images, you know, are not exact images. We're not remembering perfectly ever. Um, and then we can, we take those patterns from the past, project them into the future, but we also do it with other people. We imagine what it's like. We put ourselves there. And it's not, I disagree with certain philosophers, it is not a cognitive intellectual act but very much a feeling bodily experience of entering the other. Um, and we do probably, it seems very clear that people do have mirror systems, you know, that, so that we're literally uh, 
in our brains imitating the actions of others. So we have just a bodily access to the other. But uh, this is what you were just uh, pointing out again, Katharina, the question of um, <laughs> instead of yoga classes, <laughs> what, could be, um, what could be the alternative? When you look back at, say, the past two, three years and you've become really very present, very successful, has that changed um, your view on the system because you have a major role now in the art system? Do you think you have more influence to change things because you've reached that point now? Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know whether I can answer the question, but I, I don't know whether... I mean, I'm working, on the other hand, in such a small field that is... Um, we were talking about it earlier. I mean, there's way other stuff going on above our heads. I mean, I'm just saying there's the, uh, the TTIP... Um, Uh, demonstrations down in the south of Germany, uh, the ideas of how they're called. I don't know whether these things, I mean, this is maybe now a little eclectic or esoteric, but I do believe that there are totally different orders. I, I mean, that's the question of what kind of order or uh, uh, disturbance of the order you realize is happening there and how, in the big scope, how far, I mean, What does it look like, look, uh, the, what we are doing from Mars, or, you know? <laughs> is there really the idea of... Now, you're asking a question of um, influence, yeah. of personal influence. Because you were saying earlier that, for oh. example, women sometimes... You, you use the word lazy, I think. To speak up and yeah, say exactly. what they... Yeah, so, I think we have to take care of... But once you are in a position like you are, you two are in uh -huh, a position oh, that's to what speak you're up, okay. you know, to talk to... What you say means something because more people are hearing what you say. Yeah, but the thing is, yeah, I mean. So, do you have? Do you feel you have like a, a certain responsibility to be more engaged in those uh, I issues? I think we all do have it. Um, I do think I didn't take it up very early, and it's not such a long time that I would sit here like now tonight. And I want to thank. I'm flattered. I may sit here with Siri and, um, yeah, as your guests also. No, that's true. No, I do um, uh, also... I thought I had a chance of speaking up in that matter, especially because my work isn't classified from the outside as a feminist position. And, um, um, and I think people do not think that you have these interests when you don't do that work. And I've started to see it more and more the more successful I am. Uh, because I do see that it's getting less and less, there are less and less possibilities of doing very ambitious work in the sense of support that you need to do that, uh, because there are not many institutions that allow you to do it, and there are amazing people to work with. That's what you want to do, and therefore there are more people queuing up to get in. And there you, of course, see how the filter is working, and you do see that you are not properly discussed, because... Um, there is an interesting issue with the work I'm working with. I'm, as I said earlier on, I deal with color, which is very dubious to the intellectual. Um, uh, constr uh, yeah, I like your laughing. Yeah, laugh, yeah. It's wonderful. yeah, I mean it's actually fun. That's true. Of no, okay. No, but you're going. exactly. Um, I'm touching upon a point that has um, been an issue with my work a lot because it is kind of also dealing with the um, area of the um, prelingual, in a sense which makes it very hard and therefore very often um, dismisses the work towards like issues that I find very interesting in terms of rela my relationship of the, the painting that's independent from location but at the same time um, uh, actually riding over location in a certain sense and this issue is a very um, is creating a space that has nothing to do with uh, scale or multidimensionality but with um, a certain paradox that I think is the basis of our um, uh, relationships and that we're actually able to um, intellectually um, um, 
digest and um, organize and analyze paradoxes. And um, that has never been taken up by none of the intellectual writing papers or issues that we have here in Germany. And there's a very big and very amazing and beautiful tradition discussing contemporary art especially. And uh, it is a very uh, dubious subject that I'm dealing with. And I think that's why, how I got in touch with all these um, problems and questions, even though not working with these so-called um, feminist feminist. No, um, it's true, but I mean, it's a, it's a demonstration of, a, of a, a profound intellectual narrowness not to take up the issue of co color as, you know, a serious... Yeah, it is a tradition of being female and emotional. Exactly, because so. colors are associated with emotion. But we remember here in Germany, Goethe took color very seriously, as we know, and so did Wittgenstein, his whole book on color. Um, and also, as far as perception goes, it's a, it's a deep question. But, you know, again, I find that there are too many people in the art world who are sort of using, you know, the cold leftovers of French literary theory to talk about art. This should end for good. <laughs> How would you like the discussion to I be think, well, I, I mean, I think, you know, I, I've written about painting, and I think that, you know, it's a phenomenological experience. It's one that happens between a spectator and the work of art. And in that case of this, the work of art is never just an object. We treat the work of art as something imbued with the consciousness of another person. So it makes it an intersubjective. The meanings are created between the person and the work of art. Um, it's a philosophical position. But I really think it's true. There's no, you know, the idea of judgment, objectivity, curation, these are all fine, you know. But finally, works of art are animated in and by the spectator. And this also, I mean, what a great, you know, philosophical tradition you hear, have here. Um, J-R-O-O-S, Gruss, talked about the movement inside a person, imitative movement in aesthetics when you're looking at a work of art. Uh, the word Einfühlung was originated in Germany in aesthetics. I think bringing back the whole being and the whole body to the study of aesthetics is a great thing. That's my opinion. But in, in that retrospect, do you think um, that perception is also divided into, or can be divided into a gender-orientated experience? Or would that what you were describing is in some ways could be gender-free? So my question would be also when you talk to people who go to your exhibitions, do you get the impression that women look different than men? Because so often we have discussed the question... What do you think? <laughs> you know, that do, women, do female artists work differently, but do we, from your experience, from readers and from viewers, visitors... Yeah, we just said that we think they do, I guess. I, I, um, yeah, of course, because, of, of, because nothing can be seen without the gender, because it is attributed towards certain um, uh, abilities to influence the society. Yeah, and also the spectator, we're all creatures of our past, right? We're all creatures of our own experiences that are in some way uh, uh, built in. And I think actually one of the reasons that a lot of women artists, not Katarina, have dealt so much with the body as a subject, I mean, Louise Bourgeois is a good example, um, is because the body is so defining for women in ways that it hasn't been for men. Uh, but certainly it's not a necessary subject. That's true, but it's interesting considering this exhibition that uh, we were asked why the focus is, for example, if you look around here, the focus is on the body. And um, the question was, is it something that is like a cliche that female artists deal with the body more often than men do? Or is it just because we made this choice? On the other hand, we were talking about earlier about the um, most successful female artists nowadays. 
Living Artists, Marlene Dumas, uh, Cindy Sherman, uh, Marina Abramovic, and they all deal with identity, identity and their body. So is it something that we have to just accept as something part of the artistic process? I don't think so. I, think I don't either. <laughs> Go ahead. No, maybe you, you, um, no, no, please, No, no, I think please. you were about to say something no, no. really fascinating. No, as you no, already no. <laughs> I just, I, I... Be fascinating. No, no, I... Again, I, I, again. I don't think so. I mean, I, I really think um, that men and women are a lot more the same than different. You know? And, uh, and that... You know, I can quote myself in the Summer Without Men, or quote Mia, who says, it's not that there's no difference between women and men. It's, uh, it's how much difference that difference makes and how we choose to frame it. Yeah, and that we are actually, uh, I mean, what we are, uh, I mean, the issue is, in my case, for example, I'm not unhappy about whatever, I don't know anything, I haven't learned all these things that also Siri knows about, much about, but I'm complaining about that we're getting different rights. Yeah. That is the big difference. We don't have the same rights. Yeah. For what? For everything. <laughs> and I think it's actually, um, I mean, it's great that there is Marina out there and doing significant work or... Um, Rosemary Trockel or, you know, or Marlene, whose work I absolutely admire, but I do think uh, there is a certain, um, they're being let do that work also. It is um, uh, good if there is that work out that women do deal with their bodies and birth and, and empathy, for example, like that Marina has been dealing with a lot. Yeah. That's uh, like a little bit like giving them the area to be, to work in. And they did most of it. That's amazing. They did with what they were given, um, like something really shocking. They went as far as maybe people wouldn't go otherwise, because when you're maybe being given a restricted area, um, then there comes this, um, this resistance. Is, um, you feel it in their work and that wrath and that kind of yeah. unhappiness, that deep unhappiness and sorrow about it. And I do think that it is um, interesting to understand that we, it is always difficult to, to work with resistant against, resistance against something. Uh, that is something that we learn at art school, and that was an interesting thought. I learned when I was going to school, you have to, be, you have to work against something. Yeah. And I was thinking, why? It makes you so deeply unhappy. <laughs> but there was the idea, once you work against it and you surmount the, the hurdle, then paradise will come, and glory and all that. And that is a very, because you feel yourself so much better if you go against some sort of resistance. And I somehow under, uh, put other rules up after a little while because these big installations in, um, on site make you um, uh, feel very restricted if you uh, say you only r need this screen and then you have to make it exactly according to the model. So I thought, okay, nothing can go wrong. I will just develop it all on site. And that was an interesting thought because it was actually against the model of resistance. And I think a paradox is also the ability to work with um, uh, contradicting or contradictions or contradiction, contradicting parameters, but they're not a resistance against something else that's the other which is um, a priori excluding your opponent or your other or the, the next. And I do think that's maybe a big change where we are um, uh, dealing with. And that could be interesting to be there, as you like to say, an American proactive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, but I think too, let's, I mean, this is in literature as well. It is true that, you know, women writing sort of confessional Memoirs. In England, they have a name for it, misery memoir. <laughs> I love that word. Misery memoirs or writing books about, you know, horrible, sad love affairs, uh, you know, suffering women, women who are, you know, in deep crisis about their bodies, uh, in, about motherhood. All this stuff is embraced, very highly embraced. Because those women are not stepping out of the zone of, 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 of comfort, you know. 
but you write a highly intellectual novel that male no novelists are churning out all the time, and you bet there will be celebration and there will also be a lot of irritation. And you see, there's a difference. There is a big difference. You're supposed to be writing about, and everybody tells you that your work is autobiographical. Now, I would like to know how a person like me who's written two books as men, and you know, I've written only six novels, and one in the third person, and the other have female narrators. These people are so different. How the heck is, is everything about my life? People do not say that to male novelists. Or the male novelists declare that it's all about their lives, and everyone says, oh, that's so sensitive. <laughs> oh, look, he's, he's, oh, he's divulging these details about it's so lovely. That is not how, how women novelists are received. You know, it's, there's a kind of denigration. So, you know, anything confessional is regarded as kind of garbage, but the fact is, I don't do that kind of work. Um, but, but nevertheless, I'm accused of doing it, mm. you know, and that fascinates me. So, um, did you want to say something to that? Yeah, I'm <laughs> wave a little. Yeah. No, but I was wondering, um, I was come, somehow cruising back to that question, were there men that supported your work? And, um, and as you say, there is this kind of overall um, echo that you get sometimes to your work, or you tend to read critiques about something else, like I just read the, in Germany, not so very positive um, reception of the Biennale of Venice, which I thought was a really great show, but I was actually ashamed and also um, a little bit... Oh, not ashamed, but I was um, shocked on how um, undifferentiated a lot of it was, and also that curator would um, actually come from a very different, not Eurocentric yeah. point of mm -hmm. view, and all of a sudden it was too much, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> and I was thinking, um, but then again, there are these other voices that you get that are not coming as a group. Yeah. And once they're not in the group, they're actually very, very differentiated. And also I got very, very supported by men at points. And at, at turning points, even, I would like to say. Yeah. And even more supported, if I would like yeah. to can uh, chip it in, uh, more supported than by women. Mm. Yes, yeah. and that's, that's, that's the an other thing. Yeah. So it's, so it's, a, it's a blend. Mm. Yeah, definitely. So to um, come to an end uh, now, after over an hour, um, I would like to kind of come back to like one question which uh, came back to me talking about how we can destroy patterns because I would like to go out of this discussion and think like, yeah, yeah, I can change the world and you tell me how. And you used the word irritation. And I was wondering, uh, you know, people are irritated by your work and people are irritated by your work because you're a painter, you use color and you're a feminist at the same time, you know, which people don't really get together. Might that be a possibility in general for us task for at home, homework, to be more irritating <laughs> to people? I don't know. Surprising, irritating, I mean, not as in, as in you know, we don't have to be confrontational well, all the time, but well, like... Well, you know, in good art for me, of, of any kind, good art always surprises you. It always breaks expectations in some way. And so that, you know, you don't get it right away. You have to think about it. You have to return to it. I mean, this is with visual art, but also with literature, that you, I mean, that's what's beautiful about, about it. And that's when you have to use your consciousness when uh, for novel things, for what surprises you. And so sometimes making art itself can be a way to break patterns. I mean, books especially, they're only read one reader at a time. And, you know, I'm lucky enough to have had readers tell me that something changed, something happened. And, uh, and the other thing I think what Katerina said is to be bold, to speak and not be silent. Yeah, and I think with all things that concern our living together, um, 
and um, hmm, I just wanted to say something so great. What was it again? <laughs> Um, so, I mean, we can all try, even, you know, most people here might not be artists. Also, last thing, yeah. there's nothing wrong with being irritating, hmm. you know, yeah, and I think that's that, okay. Yeah. To be an irritant can be a good thing for the culture. Yeah, maybe that's something that we... Um, we want more than we think. Yeah, We're looking for exactly. the singularity. We look for the one crazy T-shirt that the neighbor doesn't have, actually. <laughs> and I think that maybe um, another thing could be great to um, just let every possible means be a means to make it or direct our um, needs and we take care of our needs, right? So there is no just one way. There is no way to just say, I'm only for the quota, you know? Mm -hmm. Unless we don't get the 30% into... Um, or the others that say, no, I'm totally against it. I think all these things are loss of energy. It's Anything can be good. A little wriggle of the toe is already a little bit of gymnastic. I don't have to have a one-year lease for a gym to get better, you know. I mean, there's all sorts of little things and big things and speak up and, and help and, um, and say, hey, I like your shoes or what, you know, <laughs> even though you have never met the person. I think there are all sorts of things that open us up for other situ for uh, more... Um, like um, amazing um, world outside. It's a little boring out there, don't you think? I mean, we all look a little bit the same and we are so tight and take it all so seriously and it could be um, far more um, outrageous life. Mm. And still we go, we cross the street when it's green, you know, because... I think be this both. is actually uh, the perfect homework for all of us now. So we all go home, we surprise, you know, you don't, you start anyone with not we going meet on home. the street. Don't go home. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise yourself in front of a mirror. Or go to another home. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise the neighbor who's sitting next to you. Thank you very much, Siri Husted and Katharina Grosse.